Hello everyone and welcome back to Seeker Plus and our series on supersonic transports. I'm your host Julian Huguet and in this episode we're going to take a look at the three big players in the first era of SSTs. If you missed our first episode that was all about the physics of sound and why it's so dang hard to break the sound barrier, go back and check it out because it's going to make a lot of this make a lot more sense. Part two of our story involves gorgeous engineering, Soviet espionage, and terrorizing citizens of Oklahoma. So let's get into it. The first sonic boom from an aircraft rang out over the Mojave Desert in Southern California in October of 1947. Piloting the rocket-powered Bell XS-1, Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier and joined an exclusive club, of which he was the first member. Better known by its later designation of X-1, the XS-1 was built for speed. Maybe that's why it was XS. It had a body shaped like a 50 caliber bullet, wings that were thin but very strong, and control surfaces at the tail that could move as one big unit so they'd work despite shock waves. That last innovation was a major breakthrough for high-speed flight, and it was kept top secret. It would give early American fighter jets an edge over their Soviet-made opponents in the Korean War. Less high-tech was the broom handle Jaeger needed to close the cockpit door. You see, the night before his history-making flight, Jaeger was in a horseback riding accident and broke two of his ribs. He kept his injury a secret from his superiors so he wouldn't be replaced, but when he realized he couldn't shut the door inside the cramped cockpit, he came up with this crude solution. And I hope at some point someone called it a sonic broom. Crazy as that is, it's not the only story I have for you about a pilot hiding broken bones so he could fly a dangerous supersonic aircraft. We'll get to the other one later. With Jaeger's flight, the sound barrier was officially shattered, and by the 1950s, military jets were routinely breaking it. Not just smaller fighters, by the way, but big, heavy bombers, too. So, the next logical question was, when would the public go supersonic? When could anyone be like Chuck Yeager? Racing to establish themselves at the forefront of what was thought to be the future of air travel, three big players emerged. The United States, the Soviets, and a cooperative effort between the French and the British. And yes, I listed those in order of least successful to most successful. So, let's start with the Americans. Being the first to break the sound barrier, you'd think they'd had a head start, but they were caught flat-footed in 1963 when the airline Pan American ordered six SSTs from the French and British. As a matter of national pride, the U.S. launched its own government-funded program and ultimately selected a design by Seattle-based Boeing in 1966. Fun side note. The next year, Seattle got an NBA franchise, and the fans voted to name the new team the Supersonics after Boeing's flagship project. The basketball team would fare better than the plane. A major part of Boeing's design was a variable geometry wing, otherwise known as a swing wing. At low speeds, the wing pivots forward, providing better stability and slower takeoff and landing speeds. At high speeds, the wing pivots back, and the high sweep angle lowers drag for more efficient supersonic flight. Plenty of smaller fighter jets and even some larger bombers have had swing wings, but Boeing's design called for an enormous wing, which in turn needed a complicated, heavy, and expensive swing mechanism to match. Before long, the project was over budget and behind schedule, and Boeing ended up redesigning the plane from scratch. In 1971, the project was canceled, and the American SST was dead. Congress pulled the plug partly for cost reasons, but also largely because of growing public outrage over sonic booms. Shortly after entering the SST race, the U.S. government tested the effects of sonic booms on residents of a few American cities, and the place that had it the worst was Oklahoma City. For six months in 1964, the U.S. Air Force pummeled the city's residents with eight sonic booms every day the weather was nice enough to fly. The people of OKC were not amused. The FAA received as many as 500 daily complaints, and a quarter of residents said they could not live with regular sonic booms. In a strange twist of what I can only describe as cosmic sports justice, in 2008, the Seattle Supersonics, the NBA team named for a project that necessitated the sonic boom tests, relocated to Oklahoma City of all places, 
and was renamed the Thunder, which is a sonic boom that's just made by lightning. Can't make this stuff up. Anyway, the tests showed that people just wouldn't tolerate regular sonic booms. So in 1973, the FAA banned supersonic flights over land. Backlash to sonic booms was growing overseas too, which was fine by Boeing. The company had moved their focus to a project they previously thought SSTs would make obsolete, a little plane called the 747. So not a little plane, a jumbo jet actually. But the ban was terrible news for the leading supersonic transport of the time, the French and British made Concorde. If nothing else, Concorde may be the single most beautiful airliner ever made. It was shaped like a dart with a long, slender body and a sharp nose and tail. At speed, the heat from friction with the air actually made it even longer. It would stretch up to 25 centimeters. Its large, specially shaped triangular wing, known as an Augaval Delta, gracefully curved out like a billowing cape or a gown. To slow down enough for landing, it had to approach pointed up at a fairly steep angle, so to see the runway, the plane's entire nose would droop, giving it the appearance of a graceful swan. Still, it came in so fast it needed advanced carbon brakes to slow it down and special fans to cool the brakes. Because of that wing, it also needed to get moving very fast to get off the ground, so its engine had a feature otherwise only found on military jets, afterburners. An afterburner essentially dumps jet fuel right into the exhaust. It provides a huge boost in power, but isn't fuel efficient at all. When Concorde was in development, jet fuel was cheap, and that wasn't a concern, but by the time it was ready for service in the mid-70s, fuel prices shot up and made the plane much costlier to run. The stress of high-speed flight also made Concorde expensive to maintain, and because overland supersonic flights were banned, there were only a handful of transoceanic routes left available to it. Every airline that initially showed interest in the Concorde canceled their orders, except for two. British Airways and Air France, and only then they took the jet because they were forced to by their governments that had sunk so much money into the project. While over 200 were planned, just 14 Concords were delivered into service. Still, what seemed like an embarrassment eventually became a source of national pride. The two airlines realized that they could charge thousands of dollars per ticket and actually run it profitably. And the jet became a favorite of the rich and famous who would zip between New York and London or Paris in under three hours. But the good times wouldn't last. Fuel was getting more expensive and maintenance costs of the aging airframes were on the rise. The beginning of the end came in 2000 when an Air France Concorde struck a piece of debris on takeoff and crashed, tragically killing 113 people. Concorde flights were paused and safety issues were addressed. Concorde was scheduled to return to service in late 2001 and did so just months after the 9-11 attacks. With the airline industry in a slump and its reputation damaged, both Air France and British Airways retired the Concorde in 2003. And with it, the era of SSTs came to a close. Concorde was the most successful SST, but it wasn't the only one. And technically, it wasn't the first. The Soviet Union also decided that it was a matter of national pride they too created an SST. Their plane, the Tupolev Tu-144, was bigger and more powerful than Concorde, but there was no denying it bore a strong resemblance to its western rival, so much so that some dubbed it Concordsky. And while the Soviets did come up with plenty of their own engineering solutions, they weren't opposed to, shall we say, borrowing some from the French and British. In fact, French intelligence arrested multiple Soviet operatives. One was caught red-handed with documents about Concorde's advanced brakes in his briefcase. His name was Sergei Pavlov, which may ring a bell, but it's not who you're thinking of. I don't think his arrest set the Russians back very much, though, because another spy, Sergei Fabiev, ran a ring of operatives that went undetected for 15 years before being charged with stealing NATO secrets. When he was caught, the French decrypted messages from Moscow congratulating him for stealing the entire set of blueprints for the Concorde prototype. By hook or by crook, the 2144 beat the Concorde into the air by a few months, and again just beat the Concorde to its first supersonic flight. But the aura of Soviet technological supremacy was shattered when a 2144 broke apart and crashed at the 1973 Paris Air Show. 
After years of delays, the Tu-144 was placed in a service in 1977, but only flew 55 flights with passengers before another fatal crash in 78 grounded it for good. Or so it seemed. In the 90s, NASA was interested in bringing back SSTs and wanted to run some tests, but there were no Concords available. They were all in use. So NASA brokered a deal with a cash-strapped Tupolev to lease a mothballed Tu-144. NASA decided to send their own pilot, Rob Rivers, who also had experience flying Concorde. He was set to be the only person ever to fly both, but a few weeks before his trip to Russia, Rivers was hiking in Wyoming, and he fell and broke his leg and ankle. It was too late to send someone else, but it would be an embarrassment for NASA and the Russians if the press saw a pilot from the West limping aboard the iconic plane in a cast or on crutches. So, Rivers hid his injury and walked on his broken leg and ankle in front of the cameras, causing him excruciating pain. Also, he'd be allowed to fly a 70s-era super-fast jet that had a history of breaking and killing multiple people. Test pilots are a different breed, I tell ya. That NASA study into SSTs ended in 1999, but in the last few years, the agency and a few private startups have decided to take another look at bringing them back. We'll look into how the glory days of supersonic airliners might be coming back in the next episode, but for now, that's where we'll leave it. This was a longer than usual episode because if you couldn't tell, it's a topic I am particularly passionate about. But I want to hear about what excites you. Let us know in the comments and we may just do a series on it. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you for the next Seeker Plus.